Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 40. I cannot believe we're already up to 40. That's that's crazy. That sounds like a lot. Oh, it is a lot. I've had it for a bit. Anyway, this episode is Christopher Patrick Nolan. That's right. I got Christopher Nolan. I, sorry, Chris, if you're listening to this, you've heard that a million times. But I had to. I had to. Right? Right? Anyway, uh, Chris is a fantastic fantastic guy who's so easy to chat with and you'll know him as Toshma Jeffkin if you don't know that name you need to be doing your research he is one of the rebels that Darth Vader uh well he didn't get slaughtered but all his friends did uh, at the end of Rogue One he's the one that ran with the card and pulled the lever down and yelled launch that's Chris yes you know that performance that made you feel terror that was Chris He's an incredible actor, great dude, from Ireland, which anyone who's listened to past episodes knows how much I love Ireland. Um, But he went from Ireland to New York and then just took a bus, well, buses, took multiple buses, and just kind of went across the U.S. and landed in Los Angeles. And uh, when we start talking, we talk about how he got involved in set dressing, which is, you know, populating an area of a movie and making it look like the set that it needs to be. He worked on Pulp Fiction, guys. That's right, Pulp Fiction. He worked on that. And then he talks about how he got into acting and how just watching actors do their thing inspired him to give it a shot. And from there, he went to drama school. He ended up on the West End, performing at the West End with Sir Patrick Stewart. That's right, Patrick Stewart. You heard me correctly. So he performed uh, the Scottish play, if you know what that is, uh... You know, we're going to say it. He says it. I'm going to say it. He performed Macbeth, Shakespeare, with Patrick Stewart, which is crazy. Then went to New York and did it in Broadway. What? He worked on War Horse, which, uh, you know, previous uh, guests Tom Wilton and Derek Arnold also worked on. And then he was in Rogue One, guys. He was in Rogue One. We talk about all kinds of stuff. The audition that got him that role. Great stories about Gareth Edwards. uh, Obviously his name. Uh, I would venture to say that this is the cool Christopher Nolan that we've got here. You guys are going to love him. Um, But we even talk about, like, how late the scene with Darth Vader was added to the movie. And you are not going to believe it. It is nuts. So keep in mind that the movie came out in December of 2016. And he will tell you when they filmed that. And it's bonkers. It's bonkers. But he's a great dude. Uh, We're definitely going to have him back on sometime. Uh, Follow him at Chris Pat Nolan on Twitter. And uh, yeah, enjoy this interesting podcast episode number 40 with uh, Toshma Jeffkin. Chris Pat Nolan, the Republic hero that is responsible for uh, the rebellion still being around, for giving us hope. Without further ado, roll the theme song. So you take this bus from New York, Boston, Trade all the way across the country, and then you make it yeah. to Los Angeles, and then it wasn't a bus. It was lots of different buses. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It wasn't a singular bus. No, it's... no, no. Oh my God! Can you imagine? That'd be um, insane. And then you got involved in set dressing. How, I did. How, how did that happen? It happened. I had um, a roommate, mm-hmm. a flatmate um, at the time, who was like a runner for a production uh, company. Okay. And they were filming, I believe it was a car commercial. They did, they did a lot of commercials. And the uh, he was helping out, like, the location guy, and it was shooting. Um, they were sort of closing off a street. It was one of those car commercials where, you know, a car flies along a street, mm-hmm. and they needed to sort of stop the traffic, and it was early morning. And they just needed a, an extra, you know, pair of hands. And uh, my friend said to me, Oh, you know, are you free? Do you want to do it? And I was like, sure, why not? And so I went along and kind of had a 
great time. Basically, just stood one end of a street and stopped off, stopped the traffic, and uh, and all that kind of stuff. But it was it was my very first sort of step into that world. And sure, uh, from there, I yeah, I did some more commercials for that company, and then I got friendly with I think a a guy from the art depart from the art department on one of those commercials who was then going on to uh do a, I think a TV movie and he asked if I would be interested in working in the art department and so I said yeah sure I'll give that a go and um at first I was literally like just sort of um moving things around the set or uh, you know mm -hmm. collecting collecting things from uh, various prop houses around Hollywood in, in, in a truck and dropping them off. And and then I sort of progressed up to actually sort of being able to sort of dress the sets where you'd sort of spend, you know, a couple of days or however, however big the set is, you know, turning either a location or a, a, a built set on a soundstage, you know, sure. turn whatever need be, whether it was a house or a police station or, a, you know, whatever it was. So that was kind of fun. And um and then I progressed again then to to um, being what they call the onset dresser, which was a lot of fun, which means um, the onset dresser is the sort of designated person for the art department that stays on the set while filming is happening. Sure. So, yeah, so it was really cool because then you're actually sort of there with the whole crew, with the camera, with the director, with the actors, and you are, you know, there to do whatever they need when it comes to the art department so whether it's like oh you know we need to take we need to move the camera around so we need to sort of move all this sort of dre set dressing or if they want to sort of film in a certain direction and they want to have you know props or set dressing sort of um in the corner of the shot or you know there's all kinds of just little things that arise you know mirrors that sort of are reflecting the camera that need to be gotten rid of and oh yeah so it's so it's it's all of that kind of stuff but it i really enjoyed that because as i said um you know you, you you're there and it's live and you're seeing the filming and you're you're seeing all the takes and um you, you really do feel part of the process which is is sort of what i liked which is what i find uh fascinating in in film uh, world, you know, just all the different components coming together to make this uh, finished product, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So it's it. It was really fun. Yeah, so I did that for like five five years, I think. Really? So is this, is is there a difference between the set dressers and the props department, or it's all part of the art department that works together? It's kind of all part of the art department, but there is a distinction between like the set decorating department mm -hmm. um and the props department the props department will be much more um predominantly on set the whole time and they'll be like what would the what what would be called sort of hand props gotcha. so it would be things like the actors would use um specifically so in the script if it was like you know mentioned that whatever character discovers a you know secret gold credit card or sure, something sure sure that is what they call a hero prop so the prop guys will have researched that maybe had it made you know um looked after it given it to the actor etc um and oh, so yeah. that, that would be their department anything that sort of actors hold or touch or use or specific things that are mentioned in the script would come under the sort of jurisdiction as it were of uh the prop department gotcha okay so set dressers do you so you you populate the set with to make it look lived in in like a location do you have to like do, do they give you like a budget and you go to like thrift stores and whatnot like all right we're gonna need this kind of cup and these kind of chairs how does, sure. how does that work Sure, it's it's kind of exactly like that. I mean, obviously, it depends on the the budget of the film of course, or the movie course. or whatever it is, and it can it can literally go from you know real low budget sort of you know go find these things or <laughs> sure. you know uh, kind of you know get what you can and we'll spray paint it and yeah. <laughs> make it work um, to huge budgets where 
you know, whole sets are built and uh, specific um, furniture and everything are, is made. A lot of the interior set dressing will be hired. Mm-hmm. So there's like prop, what they're called prop houses in, in Hollywood and I guess in yes. various cities all over the, the country and all over the world where you basically rent um furniture and they'll just have a whole floors and floors and floors of all different types of uh set dressing whether it's furniture whether it's things for sort of like as i said office staff or police stations or you know um old period things i mean uh if you ever get the opportunity to go on like a back lot you know i worked a lot in the back lot of uh paramount Oh, okay. Uh, Universal, um, in in ones in Hollywood and one of the other ones in Burbank, actually. But um, mm-hmm. you know, their their back lot of the stuff that they have sort of stored in in the sort of archives that you can sort of rent is is amazing. And and the people in the know, you know, the people that work there will sort of go around and say, oh well, that was from Spartacus. <laughs> sure, was, sure. You know, you kind of go that's from the wizard of oz and and you're like really and it'd be like it would be just like little bits of you know the set or set dressing that was kind of used in some of those amazing golden era um films or and and obviously modern day as well so sure i just love the the, i love the history to it i love the sort of you know you're part of this as i said process that all pulls together and obviously the art department is only one department out of many that comes together to make a film and and i, I kind of like that sure like pure that collaboration of... from hundreds yeah. of people yeah because it really to make to make it work the ingredients all have to come together you know equally really and that's whether it's the actors whether it's you know the camera department whether it's the editing you know it's 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 a real team effort and um that's what i find so fascinating sure i agree and it's crazy that movies even get made just knowing what goes into them <laughs> yeah and the, exactly. and then if they do get made if they're good it's just a miracle after miracle to make a good movie well exactly and sometimes you know things don't work out and you know things early on have Mm-hmm. haven't been done properly and you kind of think oh how's this going to go and you know it's a it's 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 a tricky one but sure. you know, when, when it works it's it's um, it's amazing really sure speaking of movies that work uh you worked on pulp fiction i did how yeah. how'd that come to be what'd you do tell me all the deets because pulp fiction is crazy awesome uh, yeah i think it was another you know I, I like i said i was by this stage i i been working in the art department so um you know you work freelance so mm-hmm. basically uh, i think i just got a call with someone who from someone who would i'd worked for before saying you know starting up in this new you know independent small budget <laughs> sure movie. Uh, this director he did he did some movie before you might have heard of it reservoir dogs yeah yeah uh, maybe <laughs> no, like a little indie kind of sleeper hit thing. yeah nobody and, saw it, um, <laughs> saw it. and uh yeah, we keep, we're kind of doing his new one and um you know do you want to work on it and so i did um and i worked on it i can't remember how much like you know uh, mm-hmm. i don't know i can't remember how it's so many so long ago now sure uh, but, it was, but it was great it was it was fun it was uh there was a lot of locations Mm-hmm. A lot of things were built. A lot of the, like the fifties um, uh, diner thing was uh, all sort of built on a soundstage. I seem to remember. Um, yeah, it was. It was. It was a fun. It was a fun uh, job to work on. That's sort of you know. It was at, at the time. You know, it's kind of it's kind of uh, it's kind of a job, and and you know, it was it was fun. The people were nice. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a good time. That is awesome. That's always good to hear when like those kind of movies that people really enjoy were also a good experience for those making it. Because if you're like, oh, yeah. I love that movie, and then the people are like, it was horrible. You're like, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, 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 it was fun. It was fun. Good. It was good. good. No, I don't have any bad uh, memories. <laughs> sure. You worked on a Tarantino movie. It's pretty great. 
Yeah, I know. That's it's funny, isn't that, it? Yeah. That, is, that is history. And not the most historical thing you've worked on, but we'll get there. Nah. <laughs> so wait, so you, you did set dressing for how many years? About five, I think. About five. And then you, then five, you, then you caught the acting bug. And then I sort of caught the acting bug. I guess from, as I say, uh, standing there watching actors for 12 hours a day. Sure. I'm probably thinking, oh, why can't they just get it right? Or, you know, <laughs> no, they were all wonderful. Um, I, I, you know, I just uh, kind of was thinking, oh, I, I wouldn't mind giving this a try. And um, yeah, why not? Looking into it. So I kind of, I think I was quite shy, really. And I kind of put it off for a little while. And then I eventually sort of thought, you know what, I'm going to I'm going to make myself do this. And I literally took. Um, just a couple of like evening acting classes at a local community college in Los Angeles. Yeah. Just to sort of kind of tip my uh, dip, I should say my toe in the water, just to sort of see if it's the kind of thing that I I could could, could kind of do. And, um, you know, I found it very frightening at first. I found uh, quite fying, you know, sort of, you know, learning scripts and getting up and performing in front of people and Mm -hmm. doing scenes. But once I'd sort of overcome that initial sort of fear and embarrassment in a way, sure. um, I I kind of really enjoyed it. And I sort of really enjoyed the, you know, the kind of, uh, I guess, you know, especially when you're doing plays, um, sort of the writing behind it all and the sort of uh, the history of some of the plays and yeah and so, so um yeah I, I kind of i kind of did that for a, a couple of i guess semesters and then i thought oh well if i want to take this any more seriously i have to sort of either probably go to new york or stay in los angeles or go to london and um i sort of looked into some of the uh things on offer in, in Los Angeles. And it was very much f- f- film orientated, which is fair enough, which is mm-hmm. understandable sure. being, being in Hollywood. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of was thinking, Oh, I want to kind of do a sort of a classical training. Um, uh, in, you know, having researched sort of where a lot of sort of like, I guess, London actors had sort of started out and, um, they kind of had to start out in the theatre and so forth. So I kind of thought, well, I'll, I'll see if I can, uh, I can get into a drama school in in London. And and I kind of was ready to maybe move back to London as well. So I've been away for a long time. So yeah, luckily that all panned out. And suddenly I was in London and I was a drama student. And you know, sure. Now, now I'm an actor. <laughs> It's pretty amazing, like you said. You move, you worked in L.A. on like the craziest movies, and then, yeah. and then you're like, hmm, I want to be an actor. So you move to London. <laughs> yeah, yeah is, I guess that is amazing. So when you did it, you you wanted to get into acting, and you went the theater route, having already worked in film. That's very interesting. Yeah, exactly. I kind of went sort of yeah back. Sure. Back to basics, as it were. I kind of, you know, so, you know, I I wanted to perform in Shakespeare and I wanted to do some sort of, you know, I just liked the sort of uh, the grounding that, that the theatre in London sort of gives you, whether it's sort of like, you know, a lot of emphasis on voice work and, you know, articulation and, and but also sort of um, just trusting your instincts and and trusting the text as well you know a lot to do with um if the writing is good and 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 so forth and and really uh bringing your sort of impression of of the right of the writing um so yeah i really loved it i think i think theater is, is is a great training ground you know you can you can sort of end up sort of you know, playing a whole multitude of sort of different roles right. in, even in the one play sometimes, yeah, you know, absolutely. just, it just sort of flexes your muscle, um, in a way, uh, in those early days. So, so it was great. So I, 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 I sort of, uh, really enjoyed 
that once I was back in London. And of course, back being then back in London, theatre is is so much more prominent. Yeah, uh, for sure. And it's all around you, and uh, it was just a real learning curve as well, in a, in a totally different way. Yeah, absolutely. And you ended up uh, sharing the stage with uh, Sir Patrick Stewart. I did indeed. Yes, Dude, yeah. How'd that come uh, to be? How was that? That was that was an amazing experience because. Um, I was, I had the good fortune of being in what they call the Scottish play Macbeth, mm-hmm. um, with, <gasps> you with said Patrick. it. I did. We, we all, <laughs> actually. and actually Patrick was the first to sort of say, oh, I'm just going to call him Macbeth. To hell yeah, with exactly. this. <laughs> to hell with this. I, I, I can't be bothered with that. Uh, so it was kind of cool. So we always called him Macbeth. Um, but That's I was amazing. actually in with him. I was, it was, it was a company that was formed. Uh, I think there was 18 of us, and we, we did um, Macbeth, and we did Twelfth Night. Um, oh, right on. So, yeah, so we it was in rep, so we actually alternated. So one night we'd sort of do Macbeth, and the next night we'd do Twelfth Night. Actually, some days we'd do a matinee of one, and, the diff- you know, the evening performance would be the other one. Wow. So that was just... Um, I just auditioned for it, like, like all my jobs, really, you know, and sure. um, I was fortunate enough to to be cast uh, in it and um, it started at a, a regional theatre in England called Chichester, mm-hmm. the Chichester Festival Theatre which is a really well respected uh, regional theatre and it it had outstanding reviews I must say, I mean it was quite amazing um, and so we then transferred into London, into the West End and we did a sellout run at the Gilgood Theatre on Shaftesbury Avenue. Um, and then uh, it we actually transferred to BAM in New York. Really? Uh, the Brooklyn Academy of Music, yeah, um, which was fantastic. And that was a sellout. Um, so actually when we were there, we then transferred, which is I think the first time this has happened for a BAM mm-hmm. show, transferred from BAM to Broadway. <laughs> what? So we literally, yeah, we literally continued and stayed on and uh, moved to uh, to a Broadway theatre and continued running it there for another, I don't know, three or four months. Um, Dude. Yeah, which was amazing. So I, I had a kind of an amazing experience with that. And, and just to sort of slightly uh, veer off that year I also pure you know it was in the stars Mm -hmm. uh, another play that I had been in called the a Chekhov play called the seagull at the royal court Mm -hmm. theater in London uh probably a year previous to that happened it was a big success as well happened to transfer to Broadway what straight, straight after the end of the Macbeth run. So myself and my wife and my two, you know, nine-year-old twin girls. <laughs> yeah. Nine-month-old twin girls, I should say. Um, oh, boy. Yeah, it was full-on. <laughs> uh, it was a full-on. It was a busy year. Um, <laughs> moved, stayed in New York, and I then started the Broadway run of The Seagull um, at the Walter Kerr Theatre in New York. Wow. Uh, so I was there until the end of the year. Um, so I spent a whole year kind of on Broadway in those two shows that started in in England, in London, and transferred over. So it was a it was a very amazing, fortunate year, you know. Yeah, you know? that is incredible. <laughs> you left Los Angeles to do a play in a t- in a small theater with Patrick Stewart, and then you end up in the West End and Broadway. And then you end up in Broadway again. Yeah. Wow. Quite lucky. Quite lucky. You s- yeah. You say luck, but I've learned something talking to people on this podcast. And luck is preparation meets opportunity. And, uh-huh. you, and you, were, you were prepared and you auditioned. You got the role. Like, that's work that you put in prior. And you were ready when the opportunity presented itself. And then look what happened. That is yeah, amazing. I, I, I think that's definitely something to that. I, th- I definitely think... There's definitely luck involved. You have to be in the right place at the right time. 
<laughs> sure, there's definitely sometimes things can be lucky, but that, like you say, I think that they're definitely in this acting game. I think there's definitely some level of making your own fortune as well, which sure, um, you know, you do have to sort of put in the work put, prior, put in the work, know your stuff, uh, be on, you know, your toes, sure, you know, and 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 you know, most of the time, if then you get a little bit of luck thrown in there as well. Yeah. You know, things can go your way and, you know, you can have a great, great experiences like I've been, you know, fortunate enough to have, you know, been in those plays, performing in the West End, performing on Broadway. Um, yeah, it was a privilege, really. That is incredible. So was there anything doing those plays that like you picked up and carried with you, something you learned? That you're like, this is this is something that I'm going to carry on. I think, I don't know if there's specific things, but I think you learn every time you do a job, good sure, and bad. Sure. Sometimes I think you, you, you know, you mature, hopefully, and you learn and you, you take on board things that, you know, worked and, and so forth. And, and a lot of times it's working with, you know, different directors that will work a different way as, as well as working with, with different actors and, and you know, working with um, some of the people I've been fortunate enough to work with is a real learning curve, and it's amazing to be in the rehearsal room, you know, and go from the very beginning of when you're just sort of sitting there in a circle reading the play out loud to sort of to see what it's like, you know, at the final performance, as it were, you know, and whether sure. that's. Patrick Stewart, you know, doing Shakespeare or you're playing Macbeth or him playing Malvolio in Twelfth Night or, you know, I've been fortunate enough, like in The Seagull, I worked with Kristen Scott Thomas and uh, wow. Peter Sarsgaard or Kerry Mulligan. Um, you know, it, 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 it's, you know, to, to see, to, to sort of see their process and see how they develop a character or how they bring things to life or how their character develops during a run as well when you're oh, on yeah. stage eight, eight shows a week for you know three or four or five months you know so it it, it bring it brings a lot you can you you can you can observe and 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 learn a lot so uh yeah it's it's all sort of nourishment as it were sure sure it's just experience that accumulates that's cool yeah so yeah did I read this correctly? That you also worked on Warhorse. I did. I worked on. I was in the stage production of it. I don't know if you're familiar with the I, stage production I, of it. We are. I'm, I'm. This this show is friends with uh, Derek Arnold and Tom Wilton. Uh, well, I was on stage with them for a year and a half. Yeah, that is incredible. I'm just. I'm, I'm slowly just making my way through the cast of Warhorse for the show. <laughs> <laughs> those guys were phenomenal. The kind of work that they did on that show, because if I just um, explain how it works, just for anyone listening who, yeah, of who, course. who doesn't know, um, Warhorse started out as a book by Michael Morpurgo, um, mm. and it's written um, through the eyes of one of the horses, uh, this horse called Joey. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's at the beginning of the, well, just before the beginning of the first world war in, I think 1912 or something, it starts. And it's about the journey this horse has basically from being in this, um, country farm in Devon in the countryside in England to suddenly the outbreak of the first world war. And, all the horses you know that were able bodied as it were were sort of sort of sequestered for the british army to be sent to france to fight in the war um so it's all written through the eyes of joey now to put that on stage is quite a challenge sure <laughs> it's um of it, course, it, you know, <laughs> it's it's yeah, it's sort of the the inner thoughts of a horse yeah. <laughs> and what the, what the what the what the horse sees. So actually, very cleverly, what the creators of the stage show of War Horse did was made from this uh, amazing puppet company called Handspring, who are based in South Africa. They made life size. Uh, puppets of horses mm -hmm. and not only horses there was a few horses but there was also uh, a few other 
puppet. So there was a there was a sort of a goose and there was um, swallows and birds and stuff. And and oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, and and they they basically told the story. Um, obviously, they couldn't do it directly through Joey, yeah, sure. but they had sort of a a narrator and they had music and then they had puppeteers inside these life-size puppets. Um, and they weren't the sort of puppets that were trying to hide that they were puppets. Sure. Basically, they were, each horse consisted of three puppeteers, two guys sort of inside the sort of, um, main body of the horse which was sort of made of bamboo so you could actually see through it mm-hmm. uh, they and they controlled they not only held up um on their shoulders the the body of the horse but they actually worked to you know one guy would work the front legs and another guy would work the hind legs then the head and the ears um were uh, puppeteered by a third guy who was standing sort of on the outside of the puppet sure. um, holding the head and also sort of holding a, a, a long pole that he could uh, press buttons that would um, I think tweak the ears and so forth oh, okay and all at the same time they would the three of them in sort of unison would make the sounds so it, it sounds like quite a bizarre concept, but if anyone gets a chance to sort of check it out on YouTube or whatever, it, it's quite amazing because you, you 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 can see the three puppeteers, but you you know in the magic of theatre, yes. After a little while, you sort of forget that they're there. Sure. And you and when when they start sort of galloping around and trotting and they do all the sort of movements that a horse would do, they I mean those guys were so incredibly dedicated to detail about you know how a, a horse would really react and if sort of someone came to touch it, how it would sort of shy away or um, you know and then they would you know they had really worked on the, the sort of horse noises. So suddenly there'd be a sort of a I can't, I can't do it, but like you yeah, know. Yeah. Sort of, a neigh and a whatever and i mean you really buy into it and it's that sort of suspension of belief that that is the magical thing about uh theater that, yeah absolutely you, know, you can be basically in an auditorium with a thousand people and everyone can be sort of taken on this sort of make-believe journey and go with it and buy into it and believe it, even though you can see these three puppeteers are sort of inside a, a puppet, but you follow the journey and you follow Joey's storyline through the war and after the war. And uh, it was a beautiful, beautiful piece of theatre and um, was a huge success. And I was in that for a year and a half and that, that ran in the West End for about five years, I believe. Um, it also went to the Lincoln Center in New York. Mm-hmm. And it's had a couple of, uh, I think it had a German version in Berlin and was in South Africa. And it, it, it was a huge, um, it was a huge production worldwide, really. And I think it won a whole lot of Tony Awards and, and all kinds of stuff. And then subsequently, it, it got made into a, a movie, like the Spielberg movie that yeah. came you know four or five years ago so um yeah i mean amazing all all, all from a book so right and you got you to know. be a part of it it's a big deal it was, yeah it was it was lovely it was lovely to be a part of it um you know it had a live band it had a live song man it, again it was one of those uh shows that just had a whole collaboration puppeteers people with very different backgrounds a- actors puppeteers musicians singers um yeah it was was great it was great and then i would be remiss if i did not uh bring up the next thing you worked with tom and derek on a little 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 indie space movie yeah what's it called it's uh Um, um, hold on i wrote it down here somewhere rouge rouge (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's when you know you're on the same wavelength when we say the same thing exactly <laughs> rouge own 
the roof. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dude, yeah. you were in Star Wars. I know. How I know. incredible is that? There's no way that glow has has worn off. You were in Star no. Wars. <laughs> I know. It's it's how I know. how it's no. I know. I know. It's it's absolutely bizarre. Talk um, to there had to have been an audition because you were incredible in it. And, oh, and those well, those aren't roles they just give to people. No, Talk they're to not. Me. The audition. How'd it go? Well, the it was cast in London. Mm-hmm. So I had been in, going back to theatre again, I had been in this sort of, um, uh, what would I describe it as? Sort of multimedia, um, kind of very modern production of George Orwell's 1984. Oh, cool. Uh, stage play um so that in itself is a a a hard thing to adapt to the stage but that's a whole that's a whole other discussion but (laughs) um uh the casting director that did really well and it was in the west end um and the casting director gina j had been to see it had been to see it and she had seen me in it and these um these characters had come up and she thought that maybe I was right for for some of the things that she needed to cast mm-hmm. for this sequence that uh, that, 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 that they were filming so basically I got called in to go along to Twickenham Studios to be put on tape now I had a conversation with my agents so they rang saying you know Gina would like to see you for this project um, and it was just very secretive. I was about to say, definitely untitled. <laughs> yeah, it was. I was untitled, and I kind of was like saying, "Well, well, what is it?" Sure. Um, so you were sort of like saying, "Well, it's you know that they're they're sort of doing kind of these sort of spin-off films, sci-fi films." Yes. And I'm sort of <laughs> going, uh, yeah. Okay. It's a war anyway, I got movie. It, it, was, it was Rogue One. <laughs> Um, but this was, you know, this was like what they called additional photography. Sure. Um, this was, this was really late in the process. Like Rogue One, I believe if I'm not mis- mistaken, came out mid December. Yep. 2016. Yes, sir. That's right. Well, we filmed this sequence. What well, I guess most people call the sort of Darth Vader hallway scene. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's sort of become hard, known as. Hard to forget that one. Yeah. Um, in like late October of 16. Did you really? So, yeah. About six weeks before release. What? Yeah. Yeah. Insane. That is so, nuts. Yeah, I know. So, <laughs> it, yeah, I know. Kind of crazy. Like it, I, I don't quite know the reasons for that. Everything about the whole film and everything was very top secret. The, sure. You know, film was called Los Alamos was the code name. No one ever mentioned, no one ever mentions Star Wars or Rogue One on set or anything on the telephone, really anywhere. Sure. You know, it's all undercover. We were filming up at Pinewood Studios, etc. But yeah, no, I, I went in to, to, to meet Gina J and, um, I had to sign a lot of um, non-disclosure forms. Oh, yeah, of course. Like you do. And, um, um, yeah, and then I was given sort of random sort of generic kind of a few, about three random generic sort of scenes, like Star Wars scenes. And they just sort of said, look, can, can you sort of prepare them now? We'll put you on tape. So I sort of trying to sort of memorize them. Sure. We'll, we'll play around with it. So we did those to camera, and the, and the casting director was fantastic. Sort of like she sort of like pushed me in certain directions, and was sort of saying, "Try this, try that," because I guess she sort of ultimately knew what what the role kind of was. Right. The stuff I was reading wasn't for the role, nor was it for any other role that I saw in the finished product either. I think they were just sort of Getting extra, the feel. yeah, just to get you on tape, see what you look like. And then, um, luckily enough, you know, a couple of days later, the phone went and my agent said that they they wanted to book me for the job. Um, I still didn't really know what it was. And, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, it was going to film the following week. Um, 
But I, I sort of said, look, I kind of need to know what's going on. And I eventually sort of found out that it was a scene with Darth Vader. So I was like, OK, oh. I'm in. I'm in. OK, it doesn't matter. Sure. Said, yeah. said everything you need to say. That's the, I'm, I'm in. Where do I sign? The secrecy was worth it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Man, how, how many days was that shoot? So I had a, like a rehearsal day and I had a stunt uh, rehearsal day, uh, afternoon and sort of did costume and all of that. And then we filmed for, I think it was four days, actually yeah. in that hallway. Yeah, so it was kind of like a week. Um, but it was amazing. Dude. Amazing. But Pinewood and to do all of that. And, uh, you know, again, the collaboration between everyone that week, whether it was the stunt guys or the pyrotechnic guys, um, sure. you know, it was amazing, really. And, and um yeah, it was just, it was just sort of, sur- it was surreal, it was a privilege, it was exciting, it was nerve-wracking, it was, it was like a real sort of mixture of everything, but I loved every minute of it, really. Sure. Well, I know that, like, when you're on set versus what's on the screen, there's definitely a different feel, because on set you don't have the yeah. music and everything, but, sure. like, how terrifying was it looking down a hallway and seeing Darth Vader? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that helps you know yeah <laughs> um, yeah i mean it was it was fantastic i mean you know i'm i'm that age where i grew up in the 70s so you know darth vader was you know i it, it really hits me for sure you know and um yeah it was amazing but but of course you know you're filming for like 12 hours a day for four days you know you, you kind of get used to it being darth vader so yeah, you do you have see him to... with a coffee in between takes yeah yeah <laughs> kind of relaxing you know yeah um, but so you you kind of have to have those sort of actor instincts to kind of keep it up because For you sure. know the great thing was was that the rehearsal day i had with with gareth edwards the director mm-hmm. and you know I, I really didn't know what the scene was going to be or 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 kind of what it connected to or anything until i got there and he basically walked me around the set and kind of filled in the the gap so I was kind of computing it in my head as I was uh hearing it and I still hadn't been given a script and they wouldn't they didn't give me a script there was a there was a lot more script actually than in the final uh edit uh so they didn't give me that until the morning of the first day of shooting um so um but but the rehearsal day with him he, he really just spoke about what the, what the scene wanted to achieve and we just we had long chats about about that really and he sort of said well it's you know vader doesn't he doesn't say anything in this in yeah. this <laughs> no he does you not know? <laughs> so, you know and 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 the, the thing that kind of the essence and the feel to it that i got from 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 when gareth was explaining sort of what he wanted to achieve was was along the lines and, and I said this to Gareth, I sort of sort of said, Well, cinematically what you're saying makes me think of you know some of those um opening shots to the Jaws movies. Yes. When you you sort of almost don't see the shark at all. Sure. And it's sort of reactions of the swimmers are then of course music and all of that stuff underneath it. Yeah. Um that kind of helps sell the fear for sure. And for sure. Level. Do you know what I mean? So, and and he was like, "Oh, that you know, that's 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 great. Use that." So I, I always sort of had that in my head, thinking, of course, we all know it's Darth Vader, and we all know Darth Vader is scary, and we know all of those things. But unless the actor plays, you know, absolutely, plays and has that sort of inner kind of motivation um himself then uh, and to to sort of sustain it for you know days and days of filming um it, it was a great it was a great help you know and and you know something becomes more terrifying when you you still see that reflected through the lens of a different character do you know oh, what yeah. i mean oh 100 percent it's I mean that that whole scene is on you guys i mean we know Darth Vader's scary but you're the ones that sell it and just Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 
exactly. So it was it was great to be able to play with that. And and Gareth, you know, he kind of has a sort of a bit of a documentary background, and he he was very free. Let let us improvise. Let me improvise. And as I said, there was lots more dialogue and. He let me improvise dialogue, and, and, and he used a handheld camera a lot to sure. sort of get a real sort of instinctive feel, like, you know, uh, like I say, documentary sort of type, war-type feel, which yeah. he was, it was great because he just let, let, let me kind of go, you know, and um, even things like the launch at the end was, was yes. essentially, essentially um, an improvisation. You know, really? Um, yeah, yeah. It wasn't that wasn't scripted. Wow. So, you know, we just sort of spoke about that, and and just, you know, he just sort of said things like, "Well, well, what, 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 what would you do? What, what would you do naturally? What would you, you know?" He was very good at sort of trusting the instincts, my instincts, and and yeah, and and me being able to throw in something, and him going, "Yeah, that that would work. Try it," you know. So. He, he, it was brilliant for, for, for from an actor's point of view he, he was i i enjoyed working with him so much because he really wanted a really truthful um interpretation absolutely and the the best thing about star wars is every character has like every character matters you know they all have their own story and dude yeah. you're, you're a republic hero like uh, <laughs> you, you, your, your guy informed the original trilogy. Like none of that would have been able to happen were it not for you getting away. It's like the rebellion. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Toshma Jeffkin. Well done. I know. No, Dude, awesome. That is incredible. And you know, it doesn't hurt being Christopher Nolan. <laughs> yeah, they, they had a giggle about that on set as well. The, the first AD loved the fact that my name was Christopher Nolan. You so have to. <laughs> every time he called me to set, because everything was so secretive, no one, you know, the crew and the other actors that were around, mm -hmm. you know, so the first AD just enjoyed sort of saying, oh, Christopher Nolan, can I have Christopher Nolan to set, please? Christopher <laughs> Nolan, first positions. And everyone else was sort of whispering, kind of going, Christopher Nolan, is, is that Christopher Nolan playing that? that? <laughs> Christopher oh, Nolan's here? <laughs> oh my god, he's, he's like doing a cameo. Oh, that's right. so clever. They've got Christopher Nolan in. Gareth has got Christopher Nolan in to do a little cameo yeah. in this additional <laughs> photography. Awesome. So there was loads of like whispering going around, and uh, uh, yeah, it was it was fun. And and Gareth, uh, you know, Gareth Edwards. Uh, you probably guys don't know that, but he has a very famous namesake. He he he. His family are Welsh, and there's a very Welsh rugby player. Uh, ah. in the 70s and 80s over here called mm -hmm. Gareth Edwards. So <laughs> he had a sort of an internal chuckle about it, and me and him had quite a, a fun banter about about that nightmare of being known. <laughs> <laughs> that is fantastic. And you both ended up, uh, you know, running from Darth Vader. So I think it worked out for you guys. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You know. I, think, I think Gareth liked the fact that he'd, he'd cast a guy – Call Christopher Nolan to order him to launch. That's right, uh, and, and he could he could be the one that pulls the the lever down, and you know, so he took some direction from Christopher Nolan. I of guess, course, take. of course, that's right, he did. <laughs> that is amazing. Well, I know that uh, I don't I don't want to take more of your time, but this was really fun, man. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Thank. You. We'll have to have you back on. You know, if you ever yeah, have things I'd love coming to. on, it's been fun. I could chat for ages but um good you know it, it's been fun we'll do it again <laughs> yeah absolutely you let me know if you got anything cool going on or just come on to chat this was this was a great time hey uh, brian thanks a lot so i have to ask where can people find you online oh yeah they can find me online at oh my god let me think i have a twitter account it's chris god what is it chris pat nolan i believe I so it's chris pat nolan it is oh, it is chris pat nolan <laughs> And I have a Facebook account, which is – tell me what it is, Brian. It's uh, uh, Chris, Chris, Chris Patton. I think it's my name. Uh, yes. Probably. You'll see it. You'll see, a, you'll see a Republic hero. <laughs> yeah, it definitely has a picture. Um, it, I, think, I think it's just my name or, or something along those lines. You'll find me. Don't worry. Yeah, Send me for a sure. request. There'll, there'll be links. <laughs> yeah. But, yes, thank you again. This was, this was fantastic. We'll definitely have you back on. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for all the work that you've done. It is very much appreciated on this end. No problem. All the best, Brian. Absolutely. And...